Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. It doesn't sound like you serve a God who is risen. I said, good morning, church. So the Bible says in Mark 16, 5 to 7, it says, As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. He said, you're looking for Jesus. For Jesus, um, Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place. See the place where they laid him. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So I believe that Jesus is in this room this morning. Come on, people of God. I said, I believe that Jesus is in this room this morning. See where they laid him. He is not there. Why are you looking in dead places? When we serve a God who is alive, we serve a God who is risen. If you believe that, will you stand to your feet this morning and give God a praise and give him a sound and give him your heart? Come on, give it up to him. Shout! God and I know this because God has been good to me and my family God has added to me and my family and so I have a reason to praise God I have a reason to move my feet I have a reason to clap my hands because God woke me up this morning and said that in the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord not even the devil could hold him down come on people of God not even the devil could hold him down. But God rose from the grave yes, Lord. and said, go into Galilee, that he will meet you there. I want you to know that God will meet you at your need this morning. Amen. He will meet you wherever you need him to meet you. I just need you to be expectant and believe that as we give him our highest praise, that as we shout, as we clap, as we dance, as we sing, as we move, as we unrestrict ourselves this morning, that God will meet you at your point of need. Amen. That you will walk out those doors like you have never walked out those doors before. Amen. I want you to walk on cloud nine this morning because he has risen. He has. So are you ready to praise God? Yes. Come on, NCC, I'm not new here. Are you ready to praise God? Yes. You guys know what I'm like, so are you ready to praise God? Yeah. And shout on to God. Oh, clap your hands. Oh, you.
for us. God is on our side. He has overcome. Yes, he has overcome. We will not be shaken and we will not be moved. For Jesus, you are here. And then we're going to make that declaration that God is fighting. But don't
For there is joy, peace, and hope. There is joy, peace, and hope. There's no one like you, say. There's no one like you. Come and shout it out, Jesus. Come on, there is no one like. There's no one like you. I have searched all over. In all the earth. There's no one. There's no one like you. Yeah. Jesus. Oh. There's no one now like you. Now lift your you. voice and say, you do mighty. You do mighty things. You do glorious things. You're a faithful God. Awesome is your name. Come on, lift it up. You do mighty. our testimonies a lot of us haven't even shared our trials a lot of us haven't even shared our storms but we stand here and say but if not God but if not God no human would have been able to rescue me from this situation no man no woman no boy no girl but if God was not on my side the enemy would have swallowed us up but God kept me so when we say you do mighty things, you do glorious things, I want you to think back. After all those times God has rescued you from your pit, after all those times the enemy tried to dig a hole for you and God blocked it, after all those times people tried to dismantle your name or spread rumors or did one thing or another, but God protected you. He sent his angels before you. I want you to lift your voice and sing you do mighty things. You do glorious things because you are a faithful God and awesome is your name. I want you to sing this song like never before. I want you to lift up your voice and tell God, if not for you, God, if not for your mighty works, if not for your awesome name, I would not be standing here this morning. Everybody lift your voice and sing. You do
Lift your voice and sing, How great is our God! How great is our God! Sing with me, How great is our God! Sing with me, How great is our God! How great is our God! How great is our God! Come on, let's say the splendor of our King. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. 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 For He wraps Himself. He wraps Himself in light. And darkness tries. And darkness tries. Trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. We're gonna say that again. Say the splendor of our king. The splendor of our king. Lord in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Darkness tries to hide. And darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice. 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 Sing how great. How great.
Now begin to declare how great your God is. Begin to declare it. Begin to declare how great your God is. Begin to declare how majestical he is. How marvelous he is. How wonderful he is. Begin to lift up your voice in worship, in praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. So just quickly before I go. Because he lives. Oh, fear is gone because I know he holds my future and life is worth a living just because hey because It's so easy to it's so easy to get carried away in the world and it's so easy to you know the world has turned this time of year into eggs and bunnies and chocolates and and uh, buy three for two Easter eggs and um, Easter egg hunts for the kids and but you know the real reason for this season is because he lives we can face tomorrow. And no matter how the world tries to twist it, we must always remain in that fact that this is the season when Jesus died and rose on that cross. He died on that cross. His nail-pierced hands died. I want you to think about how many people would die for you. How many people would shed their blood for you. How many people would go to jail for you or take a fine for you or say, it's okay, I'll take that for you? No, 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 people would do that for you. But Jesus Christ humbled himself and died for you and me. And not only did he die, but he rose on the third day just to put the devil to shame, just to show the devil, you have no hold over me. And you have no hold over death. I am the beginning and the end. I am that I am. The Alpha and the Omega. 
the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the God of all creation. So I want you to remember that this season isn't about Easter eggs and bunnies and hopping about and how much chocolate one can eat, whether it's milk, dark or white chocolate. The season is about God, God rose from that grave. When they went back to the tomb, it was empty. They went, when they went back to that tomb, it was empty. So I want to encourage you, what makes you think that God will leave you where you are? What, what makes you think that God will ever leave you empty-handed? What will make you think that God will ever leave your side? When God died on a cross and said, hey, it is finished, he meant every single pain, every single worry, every single fear. It is finished. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. time, one more time, because he lives. celebration. This is a season of forgiveness. This is a season of salvation. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Yes. It's the light of the world. It's the hope of our salvation. The Bible says this is the message that we received from God and we declare to you that God is light and in him there's no darkness. So if we say we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, with one another in love then the blood of Christ the blood of his son will cleanse you and me this is the season of purification the son of God made man just like you and I
gave is life. The sacrificial life. And he sits on the throne advocating, advocating the blood of the Lamb. He's alive. He's alive. Forget what the world says. Do you believe? He's alive. He's the life that keeps us going. Let's appreciate. Let's appreciate. Thank you, Jesus.
afternoon, church. It's a privilege to sing before you this afternoon. Um, the song we're gonna, okay, the song we're gonna minister to you this morning is "What well, Afternoon Is Made Away," and I wanted to say first, you know, we can listen to a song over and over, and it won't minister to you. It's just a song, or you have to learn a song for choir rehearsal. But I would never forget the day this song ministered to me it was the second week in January early morning I was standing on the platform ready to go to work I'd had a difficult week and I remember this song I downloaded it two days before and I listened to it and as I stood there on the platform edge tears started to well up in my eyes because I thought of how many ways and how in that very moment God was making a way for me and the way he's made a way for me and continue to make a way for me, he will make a way for you too. Amen. Amen. knowing how we'll get through this test but holding on to faith you know best and nothing can catch you by surprise you've got this figured out and you're watching us now and when it looks as if we win you wrap us in your arms and step in and everything we need you supply you've got this in control and now we know that you you made a way when our backs were against the wall and it looked as if it was over you you made a way and we're standing here only because you made a way Lord you made Oh, Lord, you, you made a way. 
Today's ministration, we want to declare, or we want to emphasize where we believe praises come from, where we believe our praises come from. Praise shouldn't just be a thing we do, it shouldn't just be an act. Because if it's an act, it doesn't come from inside, it comes from somewhere else our minds it may come from some little influence to the left to the right but where praise needs to come from is inside and that's where it needs to rise from that's where the origin needs to be God's not looking for the sad situations and everything because he's already taken care of that what God is looking for is for your praise is for your praise to rise from within you we're not waiting for a song we're not waiting for X, Y and Z you praise him when you can and whenever you do praise him that praise rises in you
praise the God that you serve. And let the praise rise from within you. Let praises rise. Let praises rise. From the inside. From the inside. From the inside. From the inside. May you delight. Glorify your God. You know the words. Be glorified. In our houses and our homes. Be
all we want, Lord, is for you to all we want, Lord, is for you to be glorified, for you to be lifted high. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for buying us back. Thank you for being our brother, the firstborn among the dead, ever living to make intercession for us at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Thank you because there are no accusations against us. Because of the blood, because of who you are, we bless you. We honor you. We thank you for today. Be lifted high in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Happy Easter. You look um, gorgeously dressed and celebratory. And um, I commend you. Commend, commend one another for Easter, for looking really good. We're celebrating. When I saw Brother Kenny this morning, when I saw Brother Kenny this morning, what came to mind was he, he's dressed like a chief of staff in the presidency of a particular West African country. Very powerful. <laughs> His sister, bid a mission to in the house, please. She's not. Sister Susan Odenaya. Could you please stand up? I'm told Sister Ola Awoshika as well. Oh, Brother Ola Awoshika. It's symbolic, it's her birthday today. It's symbolic in their families. As many as possible, please give them massive hugs. Massive hugs. You can't hug somebody if you are sitting down. BBC, the choir is outshining us. Go and hug Sister Susan, please. And thanks to Sister Tolubalaji for my sharp suit as well. <laughs> More blessing, ma. Because of our time today, um, I bring a message titled, My Dream Will Live Again. And um, we're pressed for time. So I would give us a summary of an account in the book of Luke, chapter 24. All through the book of Luke, really, but from verse 1 to verse 24. Now, Jesus was crucified a day before the Sabbath. And... On that day he was crucified, a man, a member of the council called Joseph, who was not one of the people who supported his being crucified, went and asked for his body and then laid him in a tomb. But on the Sabbath, they were not supposed to do anything. So they went away to prepare spices with which they would anoint him and preserve him as was their custom. So on the third day, it was the women who made it to the tomb, who were forced to make it to the tomb. But when they got there, they were surprised. He wasn't there. They went in. The Bible names them, about four women. So while they were still there, they saw two angels, and they were stunned. They were afraid. And the angels asked them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's risen. So they went, the women went back to the disciples who were huddled together out of fear and pain and despair that Jesus had risen. But they didn't believe it. But one of them, Peter, ran to the tomb. And when he got there, the account in Luke says he looked, but he didn't see him. And he went back. But the disciples did not believe it. Then Two of the disciples decided to travel from a, that's on the first day of the week, on the third day, 
after he'd risen, they decided to go by foot about seven miles to a village called Emmaus. They were in Jerusalem at the time. So they decided to go to that village called Emmaus. Two of them, one of them, the Bible says his name was Cleopas. We don't know the name of the other one. And they were talking. Then Jesus joined them. You know, he'd risen now. He joined them and joined in their conversation. And he asked them, what are you talking about? And they looked and said, you must be the only one in all of Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened. You must be the only one. They said, Cleopas said, Jesus was a mighty prophet, mighty prophet, used of God. He said, but our rulers delivered him to be crucified, and now he's gone. And very importantly in verse 21, he said, we thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was the one who was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. At this time, Israel was in occupation. About 60 years before Jesus was born, a, the Romans came and overran the country and occupied them. Now, these were people who, are, who had a history of slavery. So you can imagine there were slaves in Egypt, but now there were slaves in their own land. So they were very much looking forward to the promise in Judaism, in the scriptures of Judaism, the Old Testament, that a Messiah was going to come. And when Jesus appeared on the scene, at least his disciples believed this was the Messiah from the things they saw him do. And then he allowed himself to be killed. They just could not believe it. He didn't have to go to Jerusalem. They realized they were with him. But then he allowed himself to be killed. And their dream died. Their dream died. Remember I said the emphasis on verse 21. Verse 21a really that says we were hoping or were dreaming that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. From that account, I've just tried to paraphrase for you Luke chapter 24. There are three main themes that I take away from there which I'd like to share with you. The first one is that you are called to dream. You are called to dream. Now, Jesus called his disciples the same way he called you and I. He didn't call them to continue in the way they were. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul writing to the Ephesian church much later said he was praying for them. He said, I pray for you that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know the hope, the hope of his calling, the reason you are called. You are called to dream. You are called to be expectant. You are called to hope. That's the first one. You are called to dream. The second one is that now that dream may live, that dream may fade away and falter, and that dream may die. So the fact that you are called does not guarantee that the dream, the dream would materialize or stay strong through all time. It could, it could um, live, it could falter, it could die. And the third one is that even if your dream dies, God is able to, re, to revive your dream. A dream a dream in the biblical sense is a vehicle of divine revelation. Just like Joseph's dream, God gave him the dream. It was a vehicle of divine revelation of what was supposed to come. Also, a dream in the dictionary sense can be a goal, can be an aim, can be a hope, an expectation. Help me. What's that describe what a dream can be? A vision expectation, aspiration, that can be a dream as well. I've said that the disciples, their dream was that this man is going to restore the kingdom to Jerusalem, to Israel, and we are going to be in the forefront of the government. Otherwise, what would the encouragement be? They had left all, they left everything. Peter said, we have left everything, all just to follow you. So their dream was legitimate. The expectation of what following after Jesus will do was legitimate. Like your dream is legitimate as well. 
you have legitimate expectations and dreams when you become a Christian that life will be different from what it used to be. There's, an, there's a proverb that says to, if you decide to change deity or God, you say, if you won't make me better than you found me, then leave me the way you met me. So you have a legitimate expectation <laughs> to dream. In addition to being saved, in addition to being saved, you have an expectation that God will take care of you. That God will be mindful of every aspect of your life. Your family life, your health, your promotion, your advancement, everything. And it's legitimate. However, like I said, sometimes those dreams fade, they falter, and they may even die. Now, Easter is the most important and the oldest festival of the Christian church. We know that Christmas was not really a Christian celebration. It was the emperor Constantine who, when he made Christianity the official religion of the state, who changed the worship of the sun god into Christianity. But we know that Easter is the most important and oldest festival of the Christian church. As a matter of fact, I'd like to say that on Tuesday at the Bible study, we will be having Holy Communion. As many as can come, please come. It's pertinent at a time like this. Now, back to the disciples. They weren't celebrating like we are celebrating today. Although they had the news that Jesus had risen again, they didn't believe it. They didn't understand it. They had no reference point of a man who was crucified, who would rise and resurrect again. So their dream died. Lawyers talk about double jeopardy. I haven't seen Sister Lara or Brother Bayo and Johnny. Oh, yes. I've seen um, uh, Mommy Aflabi. Lawyers talk about double jeopardy. Is there something like multiple jeopardy? <laughs> or triple jeopardy or quadruple jeopardy? It's just double jeopardy. Because the disciples here suffered jeopardy in many senses, in many folds. Firstly, the dream of the Messiah died. Secondly, they were grieving the loss of a mentor, a friend, a leader, a companion. He was gone. He was no longer there. This was a man they had lived with, followed for three and a half years. I had an experience. I used to work for a company and... Um, I was there five years, but after about three years, the recession came, and they let some people go. One of my colleagues, one of my colleagues, almost every lunchtime, we would walk to the, in central London, to the Malaysian High Commission. They had a, an inexpensive canteen. <laughs> we loved cheap. <laughs> we had an, they had an inexpensive canteen, and we would have lunch and walk back to the office. We did that for many years, and we also worked together at the African Desk of Projects. But after they asked him to go, suddenly, it didn't occur to me. It was the day I was going to lunch alone by myself. I missed him. I realized I had become used to his company. So that's the second job I did these disciples faced. The dream, firstly, the dream of the Messiah had died, of Jesus being the Messiah had died. Secondly, they'd lost a companion. Thirdly, they had lost their way. They... They had lost their way. They had lost their sense of bearing. They didn't know how life was going to pan out. The fishermen had left their trade. The tax collector had resigned. So what were they going to do now? Their dream had died. In its place, it was replaced by loss, despondency, grief. Name it. That was how they felt. I, I remember watching a drama once, and I heard a young woman say she had lost her parents. And she said, if you lose your dad, you lose your balance. She said, if you lose your mom, you lose your breath. I remember saying this to somebody in Nigeria when I was working in Nigeria. I said, I heard it said on TV that if you lose your dad, you lose your balance. If you lose your mom, you lose your breath. She said, my dad died. I didn't lose my balance. <laughs> really, I wondered what sort of relationship he had with her dad. Did after my mother died, a part of me stopped breathing. 
So that's, that's the, that gives an understanding of what the disciples were going through at that time. Now, in church, in church, sometimes the impression we give is that we are not too different from the rest of society. Sometimes, if somebody were to come into our midst and hear the prayers we raise, hear the testimonies we share, hear the anxieties and the worries we talk about, the impression you would have is that we are not too different from the rest of society, that we have challenges, we have difficulties, we, have, we face adverse situations, loss of job, just like every other person. Also, because the, the, from the pulpit, the pulpit has to meet need. Otherwise, there will be a disconnection between the pulpit and the pew. The leadership will become hypocrites if all they say is, it is well, go in peace. So, ministry tries very much to address need. But that only serves to reinforce the, fee, the feeling that we are not too different. Well, well we, are, we are not too different from the world. And what happens is over time, many of us lose our vitality, lose our vigor, lose our enthusiasm. We, it's difficult to connect where we are with where we came from when we first believed. However, we are not a motley crowd of unhappy discouraged, despairing, sorrowful, down and trodden people. We are the happiest people on earth. We are, if you believe that, raise your hand and say, we are the happiest people on earth. You know, Psalm 144 verse 1b says that, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Please say that. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Again, happy are the people whose God is is the Lord. Now, what, what happens in my view is that because of the way we are made, because of the way we are made, when we are, we are complex emotional beings, and then when one side of your life is distressed, every other, it overclouds every other area of our life. So if your business is failing or your career is not going well, that is on the front burner. So that is what we see. That is what you need help for. And in this house, where we are open and close one to the other, that is what you talk about. If your relationship is in trouble, that's the look that is on your face. But the reality is that your health may be failing, but because God does not want to live himself without a witness. You have a strong family that supports you, that loves you, that nurtures you through that difficult time. You may be out of work, but God has planted people within this church who, who without your discussing it with them, they just think, how are these people faring? So they bless you here, and they bless you in that. So God is encouraging you or you may have relationship difficulty, but you're not without hope. Somebody will say a word of encouragement to you, which is very different to what happens in the world. You could be in your house hungry, not able to feed your children. You are not able to tell your neighbor who lives next door. So we are not unhappy. We are not miserable, downtrodden, despairing people. We are the happiest people on the face of the earth. Our encouragement should be that it may not be well with me in one area, but after all, God is helping me in this other area. And the same God who's looking after me in this particular regard is more than able, it's just a matter of time. I may not know how, I may not know when, he's more than able to address every other situation of my life. So why do dreams, why do our dreams fade or even die. You know, by dream, I'm talking about our aspirations for our family, our expectation that when we become Christians, life will be different. You know, our jobs, our careers, our businesses, our place in society 
Why do those dreams fade and die? There are no easy answers. There are no easy answers. But for the disciples, that dream of Jesus being the Messiah, it faded and it died. We know that one primary reason that happened was that it was a dream they caused themselves to dream. That was not the dream of God for them. It says in Jeremiah 29 verse 8, the dream that you caused yourself to dream. A, a certain politician will call it fake dream. He will call it fake dream. They dreamt, the dream of, the dream was of Jesus seizing political power and restoring rulership and the kingdom to Israel. But that was not the plan of God. That was not the plan of God. The plan of God was not for Israel's sovereignty. The plan of God was for a kingdom that embraced all of mankind. So I've said it's not easy really to know why do dreams fail and die? Why do we just suddenly become gloomy and life is not going too well? Why are we constantly encouraging one another and saying it is well, it is well? When is it going to be well? Why are we constantly doing that? So another, another reason I know is that life factors. Life happens. You know, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. You will remember a prophet. There was a prophet who, you tell me his name, who said there will not be rain in Israel except at my word for three years. What was his name? So when the rain did not fall, was, did it exclude Elijah? Who pronounced the judgment? Did the drought affect him? We're in the world. We are not of the world. So life happens. Life happens. But just like God made provision for Elijah, he can make provision for us. But it still works within the system of the world to bring about a revival of our dreams. The 2008 recession in the UK, all over the world, really led to loss of career and loss of jobs and businesses, including Christians, including Christians. Many dreams of businesses, even among Christians, died. Many dreams of a job for life died. We are in the world. We are not of the world. Moral failure. I've seen congregations where they were doing so very well. But because of weakness on the part of the leader, because of weakness, the enemy came in. He smote the shepherd. And what happened? The sheep fled. The sheep scattered. So that can happen. Difficult life situations can make you wonder, where is God in all of my trials? As a matter of fact, somebody's use of their free choice and will can cause you pain. It wasn't God that made them do it. It wasn't God that made them do it. God has not been unfaithful to you by stopping somebody from using their free will. So we are in the world. We are not of the world. But whatever way our dreams go, God is more than able to revive our dreams and to make them bigger. We know that because the disciples' dream died, but God revived their dream. Actually, Jesus himself, when he was, when now, those two disciples, as they walked from Jerusalem to Emmaus, Jesus joined them, I said. And he asked them, what are you talking about? And they said, are you the only one who doesn't know these things? Then Jesus took time to explain to them that the Messiah was not for Israel alone, that the Messiah was for the whole world. He explained to them the plan of God. Later on, we know that, not in Luke chapter 24, we know that Jesus gave them what we call the Great Commission. And he gave them a new dream. He gave them a bigger and revived dream. Such that these downtrodden people, these fearful people who are huddled together in a room, Acts chapter 17 verse 6 says, they turned the world upside down. Their work reached the end of the world. And it reached you and it reached me. So God is more than able to revive our dreams, and to make them bigger and better than we had previously. So today, what is the state of your dream? What is the state of your dream? Is your dream 
alive? Is he fading? Is he dying? Is he dead? And by your dream, I mean your aspirations, your expectations when you first believed, your hope, your aspiration, your goals. What is the state of your dream? Your dreams for your family. Is your family falling apart? Is there trouble at home? Are your children giving you grief? What is the state of your dream? What about your dreams of purpose and accomplishment? Dreams of being a blessing and an influence. What is the state of your dream? Dreams of enlargement. Dreams of freedom, not of restriction. What is the state of that dream? I don't expect you to answer, but we'll do something symbolic. We'll do something symbolic, especially on a day like today, that is Easter. I'm going to ask you five questions, just five questions. Don't mind who's sitting beside you. I want you to shout your answers as an affirmation, an agreement with God, with Jehovah, God of the universe, that my dream will live again. Whatever I state it is, your dream will live. So, five questions, we shout them out. So, you will have an answer she would have an answer. Don't, don't look to anybody. Just shout what your own answer is. Okay? Is that clear? Okay. So, my first question is this. What is too difficult for God? Okay. Are you sure? Did you confer one with the other two to tell me the just an acceptable, politically correct answer? Okay. Now, if God gave his son... Will he not freely give us all things? Yes. He will freely give us all things. Okay. Has God spoken a thing he's not able to do? No. All right. Who has the final say concerning your plans? No. Who is the author and finisher of our faith? No. We'll do it again. You know, God responds. God responds to prayer. But very importantly, God responds to his word when it is offered in prayer. So I didn't tell you the scriptural references for those prayers, those questions. I'll tell you, and I will shout again. I expect your shout to be louder, knowing that these prayers derive from our Bible. Jeremiah 32 verse 27 says, nothing shall be difficult. He says, is there anything that is too difficult for me? So I'm asking you. What is too difficult for God? Nothing. Okay. Romans 8, 32 says, If God gave his son, will he not freely give us all things? So I'm asking you, if God gave his son, is there anything he will not freely give you? No. You didn't say it loudly. No. Okay. Numbers 23, verse 19 says, Has God spoken a thing and is not able to do it? Has God spoken a thing and is not able to do it? So I ask you, has God spoken a thing and is not able to do it? No. Proverbs 1.16 says, God has the final say. God has the final say. So who has a final say concerning your plans? No. Hebrews 12.2 says, he is the author and finisher of our faith. Who is the author and finisher of our faith? Author and finish of our faith. Thank you, sir. Who is the author and finish of our faith? Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a hand. My dream will live again. My, confess it, please. My dream will live again. Tell as many people as possible, my dream will live again. And wish them a happy Easter. God bless you. Hey, Denzel. The Easter story is amazing. Yeah, I especially love the ending. Do you want to tell the story? Sure. Sure. It, it goes like, oh. it goes <laughs> it goes like, like this. this. The holiday was called Passover. Jesus came by donkey transport. Hosanna was the password. Palm branches were everywhere. From grand entrance to the final meal. From the mount to the garden. For just 30 silver coins. Jesus was betrayed. And Jesus was arrested. It, it was, was just, just awful. awful. The, the high priest and the governor interrogated Jesus. Even though the evidence wasn't too legit. Even the evidence wasn't too legit. 
the whole thing was rigged. Even the crowd turned. And they chanted, crucify him. Jesus was stripped. Jesus was whipped. Jesus was mocked. Jesus was tortured. And, they, and wore a crown of thorns. Ouch, that, that had to hurt. It wasn't a pretty sight. They laid him in a tomb. They sealed the tomb with a very big boulder. The tomb was full. After the Sabbath, the woman went to the tomb. They got a big surprise. The tomb, tomb was, was empty. And an angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid. He is not here. He is risen. Go see for yourself. And go to everyone this great news. We have a savior. Jesus Messiah. Jesus died for us. He rose for us. He lives for us. So we worship him. Forgiven and redeemed. And that's what the Easter, Easter is all, all about.
to give him glory. We are not here to put on a show. We are here to give him glory because he's risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Help us to worship the King of glory today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
just for me. You're never ending love. Never ending love. What you take for us is far more greater than anything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Happy Easter. Let's worship God this morning. Hallelujah. How many of us believe Thank that you. we were worth God dying on the cross for us? How many of us believe that? that you are blessed as we minister this song.
Hallelujah. I'd just like everybody to just take a moment and be still before the Lord. You know, we've sang a lot of songs. But I wonder, do we, do we understand the gravity of what we're singing? You know, it's easy to, to come to church and, and do your two hours and go home the same. Go home without comp contemplating what God has done for us. But I wonder if we can just take the next 30 seconds to just be still before God and just to say thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice that enabled me to stand here today. You know, there's a song which, which says that above all, he took the fall and thought of me above all, above himself, above his own desires. He said, God, not my will, but yours be done. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God we worship. That's the kind of God we, we've gathered here today. It's more than, it's more than Easter eggs and jumping, jumping rabbits. It's, it's about his goodness. It's about his, his glory, his sacrifice. I wonder if you could just take, take 20 seconds just to say, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thy the glory. But one of, my, one of my favorite verses is I, was re I read every version last night in, I think, Matthew, Luke, John, and where is it else? There's another, another version where he's talking about Christ's resurrection. And when he's giving them the great commission, he says, I have all authority in heaven and in earth. God has all authority in heaven and in earth. He commands all authority in heaven and in earth. That's the God we serve. You know, he did that just for you and for me. And we can share in that power. We can share in that resurrection power. I wonder if just 20 seconds, if you could just say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what you've done for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. You thought I was worth saving. So you came and changed my life. Worth keeping, so you clean me up inside. You thought I was to die for, so you sacrificed your life so I could be free, so I could be whole, so I could tell everyone I know. So how?
and he reigns forever. forever. Right, we're going to finish on this song that as we go out into the rest of the day, we're going to be praising our God because forever God is faithful. Forever he is good. Forever he reigns. He is the king. He is the Lord yesterday, today, and what? And forevermore. That's the God that we serve. So we're going to sing this song forever as we go out. To the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Setting sun is
God awesome? Isn't it great? Isn't it wonderful? Oh, I feel like we shouldn't live here today. But we are still coming back for more. Say to somebody, I'm coming back for more in the evening. Your loving kindness, oh Lord, is greater than life. And that is why we have come to praise you. Jeremiah said, heal me, O oh Lord, and I will be healed. You are the Lord, my praise. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together to praise you. We are not in the praising. We are not in the hospital. We are not on the street walking naked. We have awareness of whatever is happen all, happening all around us. And we are here to praise you. So, Father Lord, as we have come with the offering of praise, everything that has stood as a, as a wall of Jericho in the life of your children, they have crumbled today. Every enemy of progress, every enemy in their children's life, every enemy in their career, every enemy standing in the gates of their greatness. As the children of Israel praised you and all their enemies were falling down dead, let that happen in the life of your children, O oh Lord. Amen. Father Lord, we praise you. We love you. We adore you. We magnify you. We glorify you. We honor you. And we declare there is none like you, Lord. Let these praises be a sweet aroma unto you. Let this week be a week of great testimonies. And people will come that as a result of praising God, this is what the Lord has done for me. Let this praise open the womb of the women that they have been called barren. Let this praise, Lord, open the eyes of the blind. Let this praise, oh Lord, set us anew for greater things in your kingdom. Lord, we thank you. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. And as you say to the next person to you, surely his goodness and mercies shall follow us all the days of our life and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Happy Easter. God bless you all.